Welcome to the show for Sinners and Sufferers. My name is Cody. And I'm Matthew. And we're going to talk about hell. Yeah, it's fun come topic. Right, come right out and say it. <laughs> yeah, it's super fun. It's kind of an uncomfortable topic, I think, uh, which is one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on so that we could have a conversation and kind of go back and forth and have some nuance in that way instead of just like, you know, 30 minutes of me looking at the camera talking about hell because mm-hmm. I think it's a lot it's an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people and, and I've seen a lot of like really solid theologians like even R.C. Sproul who's kind of a despite being Presbyterian which I am not he's kind of like a, a someone I really look up to uh, has said that he really struggles with the doctrine of hell mm-hmm. uh, and I thought that was interesting and it's definitely a very hot topic among people criticizing and you see what I did there? It's a hot topic, hell. <laughs> among people criticizing and deconstructing from Christianity. And I see it's often one of those things people come for when they're like, Oh, you really believe in a God that sends people to hell? Well, how could he be loving then? What an oxymoron. I couldn't worship a God and they really come for this doctrine as they think this is gonna cut the legs out from under us. Um and it doesn't, but I thought it would be good to to get into this topic because uh, it is important. Mm-hmm. And I've seen I've I've seen just anecdotally. I don't know if you've witnessed this. People who start to question hell often, then it, it questioning hell undercuts their faith. Like if they're like, I don't think I believe in hell, then it's like, well, what else don't you believe in? And Really, if we deny it, if we deny the reality of hell, it does lessen or it's like we're trying to lessen the glory of the gospel. Because if there is no reality besides heaven, then there's no need for the gospel. Then then we're not good. There's nowhere else to go. Or mm-hmm. if if you're just, you know, merely non-existent, that, then that that still is is a different message of what Jesus has saved us from. Like mm-hmm. him saving us from a horrible, terrible fate is a lot more glorious and a lot more like, uh, yeah, I guess glorious is kind of the best word I could use there. I was going to synonym it, but it's a lot more glorious than him saving us from merely non-existence. So how we understand hell does understand how we view the gospel, what Christ has done, how, how serious sin is in God's holiness. Yeah, exactly. Like you get there pretty quickly when you start talking about the gospel. Even you start using language about saved. It's saved from what? What happens to those who aren't saved? And you, we have to define and have a strong doctrine of hell. And what churches has done for a long time is we've kind of shied away from it because it's uncomfortable, mm-hmm. and because we don't give people a biblically grounded appreciation for what hell is and how that relates to the gospel. People are pretty much objecting to their own constructed perceptions of it. Yeah. We have this idea of hell that seems unjust and unfair. And sometimes that we don't even have an accurate picture in the first place they're objecting to. Mm-hmm. So that, hopefully we'll clear that up. I don't think it's ever something that we'll be like excited about. I've definitely like I've, I've got the impression that there are people in some certain reformed crowds that are like, yeah, because it just really celebrates justice. It's such a great thing. We should celebrate the reality of hell. And I'm like, it's still like a sucky thing. Like it should like. It's not, we shouldn't be happy <laughs> to that hell exists. Yeah, it's kind of a balance, right? Like on the one hand, Revelation says somewhere, don't check me, that uh, that right, we'll say, we'll be able to recognize that God's judgments are righteous and just mm-hmm. and celebrate that. But at the same time, I mean, God says, you know, I would not rather all come to repentance. Like, yeah. There's, there's a, a way in which God is glorified through the judgment of sin and sending people to hell, but it's, it's lesser and it's less admirable than the salvation of uh, that's what we celebrate right we, mm. we don't celebrate that people aren't saved we celebrate those who are yeah well i thought a, a good place to start with a conversation is just what is hell uh, and i i really want to focus on what jesus says because i think a lot of people kind of yeah that's how you can tell someone hasn't actually read the bible is when you see these little and i'm always i don't know why youtube TikTok, all these things are like here look at these people that are anti-christian that's what you want to see and they're always like jesus didn't even teach on hell and it's like actually he taught a ton in fact it seems like jews didn't have much of a concept of like heaven and hell before jesus like really gave us the these these more defined 
ideas. So I just wanted to look at how Jesus describes hell to, to get a, a concept of, of what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. People think that Jesus didn't talk about it because he doesn't use the word hell very often, but mm -hmm. there's a, there's a bunch of parables that Jesus uses to try and communicate and illustrate what it will be like. And when we look at them, it's pretty clear that hell is what he's talking about. Yeah. So like in, in Luke 16, he calls it a great chasm and a place of eternal torment. Like that, that can't, that's what we're talking about when we talk about hell. It's a place of eternal separation from God. Yeah. Mark nine, he says, he describes it as unquenchable fire where the worms do not die, which sounds unpleasant. It also can't be literal unless they got like fireproof worms. Or... Yeah, <laughs> are they fireworms? Sounds like some kind of Pokemon. That, that would be pretty terrible. But... Um, and at the same time, which is interesting, and we'll discuss it. The same time that is, it, it's a place of unquenchable fire. Matthew eight and twenty five. It's described as a place of outer darkness. Right. So it's on fire and dark. Exactly. So like a lot of these parables, like they try and communicate these eternal realities that we can't fully comprehend or detect. Yeah. So the what it's getting at is that there's this sense of despair. Like it says that in Matthew 13, that people will be gnashing their teeth in anguish and regret. Mm -hmm. Like outer darkness, this place of separation, being removed from the light, from hope, from joy. But it's also like... The fire also communicates just that sense of like torment and anguish. Yeah. I think uh, one of the, the questions I hear a lot amongst Christians uh, and like apologists as they talk about is hell a literal physical place. Uh, and I think, yeah, we're touching on the, the literalness of it is it's likely it's Jesus describing something we can't conceive of because is we've never experienced separation from God. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, um, oh, what's the verse do I have in the notes? Matthew 5, he says he causes the, his son to rise on, on the evil and the good and sends her in on the righteous and the unrighteous. So we're all experiencing the effects uh, of being in the presence of his goodness. Everything good that we have, everything good we experience comes from him. So we could have no concept, even in our, our the worst, lowest moments that we could experience here is still nothing compared to what it'd be like to be completely separated from his glory and his goodness and his love. So I think it's it's Jesus. Uh, I don't want to say attempting because that sounds like he's not succeeding, but he's <laughs> he's explaining it in ways that we might be able to understand using language. Some things that we have have context for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's trying to touch on the idea. I think that there's there's degrees of experiencing God's presence. Mm -hmm. Right. So like the passage you quoted, there's a there is a level where God is present everywhere. Absolutely. We call that omnipresence. It's one of the qualities of God is that you can't be anywhere he isn't. Mm -hmm. But there's also a particular way God is. God lets his goodness and his glory be be seen. You know, in the Old Testament, that was in the temple and in certain instances. And now it's in the hearts of believers through the Holy Spirit. And eventually it'll be completely unveiled when we're mm. in God with heaven. So, yeah. Well, and, and I think I, I've heard it often. People have said, well, hell is not a physical place. It's a state of existence separate from his presence. But, but it, it's interesting is I, I think we have to accept it as a physical place because we know that in the resurrection, in the final judgment, both the righteous and the unrighteous are, are resurrected. Daniel 12, 2 says, Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life, and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. So it's it's not just us who are going to spend eternity with Jesus that are physically resurrected, but those who are going to be cast into outer darkness are physically resurrected, it would seem. So then that, I, I think, I mean, disagree with me if you want, I think implies that hell is in fact a physical place and I, and I think that's relevant to the the question of, of is it separation from his presence if he's omnipresent if he is present mm -hmm. in every physical place yeah and so like well the i think you worded it well like the it's implied that it's a physical place because we are there's a physical resurrection so like you're physically present somewhere mm -hmm. but that's certainly not the point is 
not like the, the primary emphasis is that sense of separation from God. Like we said, not not his presence in the way that he doesn't see you or know what's happening or but a removing of all those good qualities that we enjoy of God every day. Even unbelievers, we call it common grace, just the things of this life and the world that God gives mm. with every like good breath and beautiful experience and good thing we have. It is God being gracious to humans. So if you could imagine, like we couldn't comprehend having all of that removed, all those good things God gives us, I think yeah. gets you well on the way to understanding the depth of that separation. Yeah. I'm trying to kind of on the fly, think up uh, um, metaphors, but I was thinking hmm. of like, would God's often described as a lion uh, and you think of if a lion walks into the room, that presence is intimidating. It's kind of terrible and terrifying. But if you're a lion, if you're his cub, then it's a comfort. Then having the the king lion walk in is something different. And, and God's presence is experienced in different ways, perhaps. Oh. Right. And there's uh and I, I think often when we start talking about hell of um I think it's Isaiah 6, when Isaiah sees the throne room of God and he sees mm. his glory. And his immediate response is is despair. It's not celebration because his woe is me and he's overcome by his sinfulness. And then the angel says, your sins atone for and he can then celebrate relating to God. So when we talk about hell and the un people who haven't had their sins atoned for, there's that, that kind of terrible sense, I think, of mm. burden. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. That's a good example to Isaiah 6 because I think of uh, is it Aaron's blessing that's like, may his face shine upon you mm -hmm. or may his countenance shine upon you. So that's like God looking at you and that's thought of as blessing. That's a good thing. You want God to be looking on you. But then when Isaiah is in a situation where God's looking at him, he's petrified. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what's the difference? Ephesians says that it's because of Christ that we have access to boldly enter into the presence of God. Exactly. Well, the... Uh while well, in Revelation says that the, the sinners will be like asking the rocks to cover them, they're so desperate to hide from the unbearable presence of God. Mm. Well, and I think we're, we're kind of getting into this question of who, who goes there. Um, and and it's, uh, again, I want to start with what Jesus says. And I was, I was telling you beforehand, this list is kind of funny because it starts out. So it's Matthew 8. He says, those who deny the son. And you can say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah, and that seems Good obvious. Start. Matthew 13, lawbreakers, which a lot of us would be like, not me, but if, you know, I just did an episode on sin, which you helped write because we were supposed to do it together, but technical difficulties. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we're all lawbreakers, really. Um, then the one who's not clothed in Christ. So that's, again, what we said, those of us who are in Christ have the confidence to 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 come before him. Uh, Matthew 25 is the worthless servant, which is an interesting one. Go read that parable and try to figure out which of those servants you are. Hmm. I, I know every time I read that, I feel convicted. But then uh, also Matthew 25, a little bit later, those who do not care for the poor and needy. So if you weren't if you weren't socialist enough, yeah, if you weren't in. if you weren't woke <laughs> enough, no. but no, but it's showing that there's there's right. All these things are kind of touching on the same thing. Like it's faith in Christ is what pardons you from all yeah. these crimes, these breaking of the law. And it doesn't matter if we think we've fallen short. And that's why we were talking about sin last time. That if you've failed in small ways or big ways in your understanding, like hell is the place for those who have been not been excused for breaking God's law. Yeah. And I think people mistake and probably even a lot of Christians or people who consider themselves to be Christians, they kind of mistake hell as being a place for the especially bad. But mm -hmm. like that list, like I, I was saying, like, uh, you know, if we're not clothed in Christ, we are lawbreakers still. Uh, you know, if we don't deny the Son of Man, we're still not doing everything we could for the glory of God. We're still not truly caring for the poor and needy and being fully selfless at all times. Like, it's not just a place for the especially bad. It's the default destination of everyone. Right. So, and part of it is comparison and people want to make themselves feel better by finding someone they think is worse or maybe deserves to go there in their eyes. But in a Christian sense, there is no especially bad. Like we're yeah. all equally 
desperately sinful. Yeah. When I, I've had that, because like I, I talked to non Christians, I have friends who aren't Christians, and, and uh, one of them even just recently was mentioning a, another mutual friend we have who's a Christian. He's like, Did you know they think that I'm going to hell? And they said this they. as this, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, that person thinks I'm going to hell. And it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> I agree, but also like, let's, let's touch on why you, you're bringing this up in this way. And it's because people think that we're saying like, oh, you're especially terrible Christian. You're especially bad. You deserve hell when we don't. And, mm -hmm. and it's not saying, uh, it, it, well, it's like what well, living in Southern Alberta, it's like almost every day I get a little bleep on my phone. That's like weather warning, tornado. <laughs> it's yeah, saying, welcome to Calgary. Yeah. yeah. But saying you're like, you're going to hell isn't saying you suck. You're worthless. You're less value. What it's saying is there's a tornado coming. Be aware of the, of the reality at hand. And here's the escape plan. You right. need to be clothed in Christ. And that's actually really good. I want to build on that for a second because not being like, if we're not telling people about hell, it's not safe to not warn them. And yeah. then it not being concerned if you think I'm a good person, that's like saying, oh, I don't need to find shelter. There's a tornado coming. I'm really fit and strong, so yeah. I'll be fine. Like, it's ridiculous to try and rely on your own capabilities. Like, yeah. this is something we're wholly dependent upon grace. And so that's why Christians, when we tell people about hell, it's like, we deserve to go to the exact same place you deserve to go. We're all on the same ground, mm -hmm. but we've been forgiven by grace and it's not because we're better because that same thing's available to you. That's why we, that's why we have any of these discussions with anyone is because we want them to be on the same ground as we are. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it, it all comes down to understanding who we are to, to, to grasp the, the reasonableness of hell uh, it comes down to understanding who we are and, and who God is. Cause for a lot of people, they think of, of God, a lot of people who believe in God, who could call themselves Christians, as well as a lot of people just looking in on us. And they're like, this is what you believe. They think that God is just a big huggable Santa Claus mm -hmm. that just wants to you to be happy and to give you the good life and give you everything you want. And that we're all pretty good people. And if that's reality, if that's who God is and that's who we are, then then it is it's crazy and it seems completely absurd and unjust that anyone would go there, that we'd imply anyone would go there. But when we understand his holiness and, and that his justice and our state is fallen sinners, then that, that brings it into to reality, brings into perspective why this exists and why it makes sense with the rest of our worldview. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we, we always want justice for those we compare and think are worse than us. Like if there's a judge judging a serial killer, we wouldn't try and defend them. We'd be like, well, they're a really nice guy. They've done other nice things. We'd say, mm -hmm. no, we want, we want a just sentence for that person. But yeah. then we want, we think we're so much better and we want mercy for ourselves. And the thing about God being a good judge is he judges everyone equally. Yeah. Yeah, when when we think or if we think that hell seems unjust and we say, how could a just God send people to hell? It's not that we have a higher view of justice than him. It's that we have a, a lower one that we don't understand the, the weight of sin and the, the universality uh, of sin. There's a, a YouTuber named Mike Winger who uh, I'd, I'd generally recommend. I'd say like 90 percent <laughs> agree with him. I, but up to 99 yeah, percent. He's he, great. He makes his videos are really long, which is why I'm not afraid of losing our whole audience to him. But <laughs> uh, but he he uses this really good example when talking about hell and why we think it's unjust. And he, he says, imagine you, you're, you've watched the news or you're reading the paper. If people read the paper, reading an app, I guess. <laughs> I don't know why I said paper. I don't read a paper. Um, but he says, you know, you hear about someone and it's like so-and-so uh, did this crime and they've received a, a 10 years prison sentence. And you think, oh man, that seems kind of extreme. Ten years—that's that's way overkill. But then, as as time goes on, you you start to see interviews with the victims, or maybe you meet them yourself and you get to talk to them. And there's more details come out about the the full breadth of, of the crime that was committed and and the repercussions of it. And suddenly you're thinking, oh, okay, yeah, ten years—that seems reasonable. In fact, you know, I'm surprised it's not a life sentence. And similar with sin, we lack the perspective of God. We, th we think 
hell seems like an extreme consequence for our sins because because sin is a lot worse than we think it is. Mm-hmm. But you know, you mentioned in Revelation one day we'll we'll recognize his justice. One day we when we stand before him in his holiness and, and we have that perspective, we will get it. We'll see sin for what it is. We'll see why hell is the just consequence for sin that it's not a an overreaction that's the uh, i don't have my headphones on so i don't want to fire it in case it's loud but i have a sound <laughs> bite uh, of, of rc sproul going what's wrong with you people and that was the question posed to him it was at a, a q a someone said don't you think that uh you know hell is a little bit of an or overreaction to mm-hmm. adam and eve eating a fruit and he just turns and he looks and he's quiet for a minute and he goes what's wrong with you people and it's just like historic moment Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it's classic but yeah yeah once we have some perspective it makes a lot more sense right not just on the the severity of our offense and when we understand all that god's done for us but also a point that i found helpful is that often the consequences for actions are determined by the the status of the person you've offended Mm mm-hmm Right. It's one thing if you, you know, break a promise to your, your child and you have to just apologize. If you like if you lie on your taxes to the government, you could go to prison. If you like Yeah. If you shove someone on the street, they might forgive you. You might get a ticket or something. If you if you go up and you shove the in my whole life's been the Queen of England, mm. right? People are gonna like like you you understand what I'm getting at. Like yeah. the, the the more glorious and um, honorable the person that you've wronged the kind of the harsher the consequence so when we project that to a perfect and eternal god Mm -hmm. then a uh, eternal consequence doesn't seem so unproportional yeah i think even uh like his glory and his holiness because we have a concept of, of innocence like i think if 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 you came you told me oh man some guy like just randomly slapped me at work the other day i be like, oh, that sucks. Like, I'm, uh, that sucks that happened. You shouldn't have done that. But if you're like some guy walked up and slapped my kid, I'd hmm. be pretty fuming mad. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think you would be too. And I think all of your friends and family would be ready to throw together a posse and go find this guy. <laughs> because it's a kid. And kids are, are we understand, as being more innocent. And then when we think mm-hmm. of God mm-hmm. being perfectly holy, he's truly done nothing wrong. He doesn't deserve any offense he doesn't deserve any rebellion doesn't deserve for us to spit in his face the way that we do um it's it's a far greater offense than you know if someone slaps me in the face i probably deserve it (laughs) like right yeah sounds good well what i think that you you kind of touched on as well this idea that we we want justice for other people just not for ourselves. And I think when we think about hell, uh, we we are we lie to ourselves when we think that justice would be that everyone goes there, because like we ultimately we don't want to spend eternity with unrepentant Hitler. Mm-hmm. We don't want horrible, evil, unrepentant people to to be there and to receive all the all these great things. And I mean, we're we're all so undeserving, but it, it, at least our sins are paid for in Christ. And I think there's a a Packer quote, I won't read it, but he he says that, you know, the the character of God is is the guarantee that all wrongs will be righted someday. And that that's the the justice of hell and the justice of wrath is that every wrong, every unjust thing will be righted, if not in Christ, then in the person. Exactly right. Like the consequences of sin is death and and that either is paid through Christ for you, or people will have to pay that penalty themselves. Mm. And that justice is equal and fairly applied. Yeah. And that's part of the good news of the gospel, because we, I think everyone recognizes that there's all this evil in the world. And if God just kind of glanced over it and said, no, it's no big deal, yeah. we, we would rightfully feel that that's not right. Mm-hmm. We, so it's saying that you know those who've wronged, those who've done those heinous things, will be brought to justice Mm -hmm. and we usually we can seek justice when we look on the news and we hear about a local perpetrator but again we don't want to apply that to ourselves yeah when that that addresses as well the the question of of how is it loving And, and there's actually a quote from so i read this in tim keller's reason for god and he quoted 
Becky Pippert. So Double I will, quote. We're so I will say it's here. a quote of from Becky Pippert, but I've never read her book, so I, I did not uh, con, um, endorsing anything here. But um, but she says that think of how we feel when we see someone we love is ravaged by unwise actions or relationships. Do we respond with benign tolerance as we might towards strangers? Uh, far from it. Anger isn't the opposite of love. Hate is, and the final form of hate is indifference. God's wrath is not a cranky explosion, but a settled opposition to the cancer which is eating out the insides of the human race he loves with his whole being. Mm -hmm. So for him to just let sin run rampant, for him to just let evil go wild isn't loving of him mm -hmm. because it is ultimately killing us it's ultimately destroying his creation for like a loving god does need to address sin and to to atone for it exactly like when you love and value something you protect it and that's one of god's roles for us like the bible tells us that we're like his children or that the church is his bride like these intimate relationships and god not only has this affection for us but he's also our our protector and the one who will make these wrongs right so when in the end when those people who have hurt his beloved there there is just retribution for them mm. there's something you you had commented it's kind of the common like uh uh like almost easy answer is to say like well people get what they want if you want god you get eternity with god if you don't want god you get eternity separate from him and that's like a, that's over reductionistic like it's not mm -hmm. that, that's putting it very simply but there is a a level uh, of you know the people who reject god who spit in his face aren't being forced to spend eternity in his presence and we think that oh if, if he was loving he would force people that want nothing to do with him to be with him and that does, doesn't really follow like the logic behind how could a loving God uh, conceive of and implement something such as hell just just doesn't follow. Mm -hmm. Right. Like in those who are born again, the regenerate God's given this love for him and this affection and that. Yeah. Those who don't follow Christ don't want to. They don't want to submit to God for eternity. They don't want anything to do with him. And so like it's. I think the point of that is God leaves them in their own choices, but there's also no regeneration in hell. No one's going to be in hell and change their mind. And yeah. be like, you know what, God, you are righteous and wonderful. And I actually want to be with you now. Mm -hmm. When there's a, I've seen a number of, cause I watch a lot of debates. I've seen a number of like atheist apologists say like, even if God tore open the heavens and said, you, I exist. Like uh, they say that I still wouldn't worship him. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's like, Thank you for being so honest, but that also shows the point that that people are willingly rejecting God, mm -hmm. and when they're not gonna suddenly come around just because they're like like if God is who sanctifies us, it's a experience that sanctifies us towards holiness, that teaches us to to love Him and transforms our hearts and minds, it changes our intentions towards Him. They mean completely cut off from Him isn't where we're gonna suddenly be redeemed and have a new heart and a new conscience that desires Him. Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't make sense that that uh, someone without any experience of God or His Spirit would then decide to choose Him. Exactly. Like there's, there's this perfect love that God has for, for Christ. They have this perfect relationship. And those of us who are Christians are in Christ. We get to share in that perfect love. And there is no love for God outside of that relationship. Hmm. When, so what, what other thing is we, we kind of skipped past it, but I wanted to, to address, we're going to, we're going to talk about some challenges, some other quote unquote Christian views just briefly, but uh, I have a pet peeve with TV and movies and their uh, depiction of hell and, and like web comics, everything. I see it all over the place. I just saw this morning, I opened Instagram and there's this comic where they're joking about like Satan actually being a nice guy when you get to hell. Hmm. It's like people seem to think that, that hell's going to be a party for the rebels. And they're like, yeah, I'm choosing team Satan. Uh, but well, Satan's not king of hell. 
Mm-hmm. That is like, I don't know where anyone got that idea. He is being cast into outer darkness. Uh, but everything good comes from God. And we, we, we talked about that earlier. We can't even conceive of what it's like to be completely cut off from him. Uh, and there's a, in C.S. Lewis's book, The Problem of, of Pain, he uses the example of food. And he says, if you can't learn to eat the only food that grows in this universe, you starve. Because if you reject the food, you just think, oh, you know, whatever. I don't like broccoli and the only thing that grows is broccoli. Well, you're also rejecting the nutrition. You're also rejecting the, the calories. Mm-hmm. So the, the result is you starve. And if we reject God, we're rejecting everything good in and from him. And a lot of people think that they're going to reject God, but then find some other source of joy, some other source of, of, of goodness. And if we're relying on that, in this life and we think we're getting our goodness from something other than him we're gonna be in for a rude awakening when you know we separated from him and we realize that everything good was from him and that everything else we think is bringing us good is ultimately just a pale reflection Mm -hmm. right like with the whole like the devil's torturing people in hell we have this active affliction kind of perception Mm -hmm. when in reality like you said that the tone like jesus says in parables the outer darkness it's removing of all these things that we are so used to that we can't, yeah, couldn't comprehend of. And, and scripture does speak of it as punishment, but it's not like being prodded with the, you know, devil trident. It's just the reality of existing. Right. Just, just because God's not sitting there like actively inflicting pain upon you doesn't mean that you're not tormenting and hmm. regretting. But, and with that, one of the, one of the like, common kind of retorts or challenges that that people who would still call themselves christians will, will bring is what's called universalism and you know i i think i've shared before that i spent some time i thought emergent church was really cool i was in this kind of scene and rob bell was a big influencer in that and sort of where the reason why we no longer play his videos in every youth group in in north america is because he came out as being a universalist which is this idea that every single person that's existed eventually ends up in heaven Hmm. that that god redeems everyone exactly and and a few episodes ago we talked about like fundamental christian things like first things first and mm-hmm. that, that's one of those lines where if you cross it you, you've kind of compromised the whole point of the gospel yeah like if everyone is saved then i don't even understand why jesus had to die on the cross and if you don't need to have faith in christ to be saved then like you said hell doesn't need to exist the gospel doesn't have any point we're not calling people to any change yeah, like why, it, it compromises the whole structure why would jesus warn about it at all like why are we we told to preach at all like you know it's such we're gonna undergo so much suffering in this life we're told for for preaching well if everyone's just gonna end up in heaven anyways then don't bother Mm -hmm. just live your your comfortable life but it also just it cheapens the seriousness uh of sin Mm -hmm. to think that that someone who hasn't uh trusted in christ for atonement that that's fine that god will just overlook it eventually anyways Mm-hmm. And there's a, a like the retort to that would be, well, they still trust in him, but they just trust in him once they're in hell. And, and we already talked about that. There is no no regeneration in in hell. And it's not like well, well, Romans is clear that God's existence is is evident enough mm-hmm. that that if you aren't choosing to to trust in god and to submit to him as lord in this life you're not going to do it given eternity exactly so that that's a big problem but another concept that may be less blatantly heretical but is still a big problem would be annihilationism yeah annihilationism which is when the idea that those who don't get to spend eternal life the opposite of life is death and so you just cease to exist yeah and, and I can see, I, I think I believed this for a hot minute. And then uh, it was funny, it was, it was a good buddy of mine, Jeff, who uh, was my pastor. And then eventually I became his associate pastor. As I told him, oh, I was like, it's like, Jeff, I think I believe in annihilationism. And he's like, 
that's the stupidest thing. <laughs> he just <laughs> tore it, like, like it tore is. me a new one. But it was so good because then, like, uh, months after that, there's one of our youth came into our office and he's like, I think I believe in annihilationism. And Jeff was just so, like, gentle with him. <laughs> he, he got the <laughs> and, first like, run out of Walked him through it. But then I was like, what? And he's like, you're a leader. You should know better. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to be harsh with you. I was like, okay, fair enough. Fair but enough. but the kind of the logic behind it and why I believed it for a minute where it was just the, you know, the implication of oh, destruction. Does destruction not mean destruction that, that, you know, at some point the thing has been destroyed and it no longer exists? Um, and that that's really, it's just reading a lot in, into a word. The sort of more like grounded exegetical attempt would be from Revelation 14, which says, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And, and, uh, we'd go, well, if the smoke is going up, then that implies that the burning has finished. Mm-hmm. But, Some but even, logic there. Which, which is also just like, I don't know. It's just really bad exegesis to try and use that kind of logic. But also like if you've ever kicked out a fire, the smoke doesn't go up for eternity. If the smoke is continually going up, it's because the fire is still burning because mm-hmm. it still has fuel. So it's just a non-argument, but, but ultimately it's still, it denies the, the infiniteness of our sin that we talked about the object of the sin dic- uh, or the the recipient of our wrong d- dictates the magnitude of it mm-hmm. you know that if you hit someone who's perfectly glorious who's perfectly innocent and holy perfectly pure uh, god is, is those things to infinite degrees so a crime against him is to the infinite degree there's an in- infiniteness to our, our sin and an infiniteness to the the atonement that Christ offers for that sin and to then say everything's infinite everything's immeasurable everything's beyond the limits of human comprehension except for the punishment the punishment is going to have some kind of within the constraints of time limited like end point just doesn't follow mm-hmm. right like it the, uh, the idea, of, the point of being made in the image of God, uh, human nature, is that you're designed for some sort of eternal relationship with God. Yeah. Either that salvation and joy or separation and despair. Yeah. We're, we're all immortal. It's just a matter of where we spend eternity. And just, just as a quick tangent, but we, we mentioned in this, you mentioned in the sin episode that like a, whatever doesn't proceed from faith is sin. Like mm-hmm. it's not just the bad things that we do. It's not glorifying god as we ought so when people are in hell they're they're not changing they are continuing to deny the goodness of god yeah. and continuing to glorify him yeah so you just like keep the adding. consequence is eternal because the the offense is eternal as well it's like people who commit further crimes in prison aren't getting shortened sentences for good behavior right mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I was like, hey, do you get a longer sentence if you stab someone in prison? I don't know. I don't know the justice system. That I don't think like, you come up for parole. Like that would that feels like it would make more sense. Um, yeah, I guess you'd just be denied parole. But but anyways, both of these the the universalism and, and annihilationism annihilationism is, is awkward. they're they're kind of just attempts to to soften the reality of hell. It's people who who don't want to reckon with the reality uh, of God's holiness and our own sinfulness. So they're trying to find an alternative. They're trying to find mm-hmm. something else that, that isn't actually coming from scripture, but it is maybe a logical explanation. Uh, I like to refer to these, these, there's a few of them. Like I'll say Molinism is similar though. Don't at me um, where I call it the aliens argument, where if you show up at a crime scene and you're like, Oh man, who murdered this person? It's like, Oh, it was aliens. I'm like, well, it could have been, but you're not getting that from the evidence. That's just a, a, a plausible, if you believe in aliens, plausible explanation. And, and I think these are attempts not to to understand the evidence and form a conclusion based from scripture and what we have, but it's just trying to form a plausible conclusion from outside logic. And it ultimately all lessens other things it has consequences it takes with us with our other theology where it lessens the weight of the gospel it cheapens the significance of what christ has done right like most theological errors like egalitarianism and like arminianism all kinds of things yeah are just um 
You're like, racking up all the comments, sir. <laughs> I, I had to, you had me back on because you're like, we're doing something controversial. We should get Matthew back. He's good at that. Yeah. But no, the, the reason we have all these disagreements, I'll put it lighter then. Yeah. But is because we have these things that we want to believe with scripture. Something doesn't sit right with us. And so we're, our nature wants to stretch for anything that will give us an answer to satisfy that. So sometimes yeah. we'll accept a really weak and even unbiblical argument if it's telling you what you, the perspective you wanted to hear. Yeah. And that's what I think these are. That, that was my main point. Like yeah. universalism, annihilationism. These are just trying to get answers that are easier to digest. And when we try and twist the Bible to fit it, people are like, well, that's good enough. I'll take that because yeah. it's easier than the truth. But I think if, if, there's never anything in scripture or in our faith that challenges or even offends us though. I hate the word offense because it's a choice. You choose to be offended. That's, that's <laughs> you choosing so. to respond. I think, I don't think so. But, uh, um, but if there's nothing that challenges us or like pushes against our, our presuppositions, the way we want things to be, we're probably not really reading scripture for what it is. Because the reality is we're being shaped by influences of a sinful world. Mm -hmm. And God is, being holy is to be completely set apart, completely unlike and separate from. So if we're looking at something, someone completely unlike and separate from us, I mean, like, that's all fine. It's like we're not really looking at them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we, we all have, like us, me and you included, have these perceptions that we bring to the way we understand the Bible. Mm -hmm. So we have these constructs of like, okay, God's loving, but here's how I understand love. Here's how I understand justice. And we need to let scripture explain to us what those are, not just import our understandings to it. Yeah. When I think it's important to be aware of our biases, that was a, my intro to hermeneutics class when I was in Bible mm -hmm. colleges, we had a whole class on just understanding your tendencies. Like a lot of people tend towards wanting to make everything about law and to make everything really cold and strict and legalistic and structured. And that's where, where they tend to read that into everything. Whereas I think my own tendency is actually, you know, people, people might be shocked by this, but my tendency is to, to try and read everything lovey and, and social justice. That's what I want to, like, if I was just making up the Bible, it'd be like, just love everyone and do good and take care of the poor. And that would be my, what I have to guard against in my bias. Um, and it's helpful for us to, to see, especially when we're talking about something like how, what our tendency is, where we tend to err and what we want to believe and how that contradicts what's actually being said to us through God's word. Mm-hmm. Right. Like as humans, we can have a perception of these qualities, like we can relate to God, but we have such limited measure of them that we all can't completely comprehend the depth of them. So we mm -hmm. all need to continually have that challenge and correction to the way we understand these. That's why it's good to have conversations because, you know, iron sharpens iron is almost cliche to say, but like we each have our own perspectives and biases and because of that we can challenge different things in each other and, and you know you might be able to if you live in too much of a bubble you might be able to go your whole life without thinking something you do is wrong that is and it's good to have community for those reasons so that we can challenge each other and bring each other deeper and understanding into our, our love and worship of god but, mm -hmm. yeah and that's why we that's why you're doing this, right? And people, yeah. ho hopefully you, you don't watch this just because you agree with everything we say. Yeah. It's if, because you, you, we have conversations and we want to have conversations with you guys and if, talk if, about your differences. If you agree with everything I've ever said, I appreciate you clicking like on every video because obviously you're doing that. Um, but also you're probably wasting your time. Like, like go listen to someone that challenges you a little bit. Go listen to Mike Winger. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, but, uh. Yeah, the point of this, uh, and Kyle and I used to say it all the time, and I think you agree with this mission, it's not necessarily to make you agree with us, but to make you think and to work out what you believe so mm -hmm. that you're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, so that you're not being misled by those TikToks and YouTubes and Instagrams I was talking about where they're trying to make really stupid, weak claims against Christianity. Like, just work out what you believe. But, right we just want to make you reassess what you believe is like why do we believe things the way we do and yeah. we just want to steer people back to not to what we say but go back to the bible really dig in and have biblically grounded reasons for your yeah. faith 
and well, I sh- we should wrap this up. But I'll say too, like we both part of our stories that we've changed dramatically mm-hmm. on certain points of our theology, where we were like we were completely wrong, and, and it was because of scripture and because of the wisdom and guidance of others that we were brought around on things. But on that note. Thank you for listening. We appreciate you being here and we'd love to hear from you at YouTube comments. You can message. If you message sinners and sufferers, it just goes directly to me, but I can tell Matthew if you'd like to say something to him or you can jump in the discord. I've seen people joining the discord and then not saying anything, but I feel like it's cringy if I'm just the only one posting in there. So someone go say something in the discord. Um, I'm there. Maybe it'll make its way to me now. Yeah. I had one person ask recently if we had have swag i don't know if some people have noticed in the video i have my sinners and sufferers t-shirt sometimes i'm not wearing it today uh if people actually want to buy a t-shirt just let me know because i i was paying like a hundred bucks a year to have a store up and nobody bought anything so i didn't do it oh, wow. i took it down because that was expensive okay uh, and but you're not just holding out on me because you just have a bunch I, of cool i could swag. order you an individual shirt if you'd like but your birthday is next month I'll yeah. give you a shirt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.